I'm afraid that I start with some difficulty marks, and I hope that after that it will become more simple. Um, but I think it is important first to say something about the difference between what we're going to do tonight and what I did last night. Uh, what is peculiar about the theory of entities compared with the theory of the model aspect. And in one sense, there is a close relationship. In this sense, that the theory of entities or entity structures, David himself speaks of individuality structures, in a way, this theory presupposes the theory of the modal aspect. In a way, it's an application of that theory. So I will use uh, elements of last night about the modal aspects. They will come back. But in another sense, and the way that emphasizes that, it's a very different theory. It's a different perspective on the reality. The way it even speaks of a different dimension or a different horizon. What then is the difference? Well, last night I emphasized that the modal aspects are potentially, at least, universal. They apply to all things. And in that sense, they are very abstract also modes of being. The theory of entities, the name expresses that already, relates more to the concreteness of things. It's not about modes of being, but it's about the whatness of things. It's about qualities, entities, not. You could also say it's not about kinds, basic kinds of properties that you could uh, distinguish in terms of modal aspects. Certain properties belong to certain modal aspects. It's not about the diversity of basic kinds of properties, but it's about kinds of things, not kinds of properties, but kinds of things. And then it also could be clear that the diversity we speak about tonight is a much greater diversity than the diversity I talked about last night. The diversity of modal aspects, I said, it may vary between 12 or 20, uh, but if we speak about the diversity of things, uh, the diversity is much greater. And here certainly you can't speak of universality, that the, th the way we analyze applies universally to all things. What Dolby tries with his theory of entities is to find a kind of theoretical framework um, to find some order in the diversity of things. Uh, it's a great diversity, how can we find some order in that? And he's working that out in a philosophical theory, which does mean that the order is only limited. It does not go to the concrete kinds as they are sometimes distinguished in the special sciences. So it's again about the diversity in reality. To give another uh, characterization in relation to the modal aspects, you could say it's the diversity of reality as a whole. The theory of entities speaks about the diversity of things, of concrete things. Now I relate this and then I come to my easier remarks, uh, to what is common in philosophy or in science. In a way, the modal theory relates very much to the approach of the special sciences as they have been developed, say, since the 16th century. Uh, because the special sciences look at reality from the perspective of some functional relationships, physical relationships, biological relationships, economic relationships. So it's always a functional approach. 
And the different functional approaches relate to the different modal aspects. The theory of entities does not refer to the functions of things, but to their integral wholeness. And that's more related to the older approach, at least in philosophy. Philosophy and science was not so much distinguished as it has been done later. In which uh, the substance of things, the essence of things, the oneness of things was studied. Um, so if you want to compare the theory of entities with what was done before in philosophy, it relates more to the theory of substances. Although Doyle would never say that his theory is of that kind, because a substance or the essence was usually seen as some, uh, something eternal, unchangeable, something not in time, but beyond time. While Doyle would say that the structure of things that he analyzes in the theory of entities relates to tempor temporal structures. It's not an eternal essence beyond this concrete reality, but it's the structure of things, but in their integral wholeness, in their totality, not in a functionalist way, but as a totality. Then to give some impression of what this theory is about. And from now on, I will first give some illustrations. Uh, the illustrations as such are not so important. They are just to illustrate, to clarify what David intends to do with the theory. And then later on, I will also try to show the relevance, the importance of the theory in trying to do justice to another kind of diversity in reality. Uh, the, the illustration that has become famous because David gives it himself is the analysis of a tree. Now, applying the theory of the modal aspects and the distinction between subjective or active functions and objective or passive functions to the tree, we could say that the tree has an active or subjective function in the aspect of quantity, in the medical aspect, the spatial aspect, which is clear that the tree takes some space in the mechanical aspects, it's subject to the laws of movement. Uh, the physical aspect, you can analyze molecules, atoms, and whatever. And the biotic aspect, the aspect of organic life. Uh, those aspects characterize the tree as such. And the most characteristic one, I think everyone would agree, is the biotic. The tree is a living organism. But the other aspects apply also to the tree. The tree does not see, but we can see the tree. The tree is not an economic subject, but it can be sold. Uh, it can be a property, it can be a legal object, and whatever. All the other aspects can be applied to the tree. So in that sense, uh, the, in the other lecture, uh, the analysis of the modal aspect applied already to some extent to the concrete thing. Uh, the universality of the aspects, what are subjective functions, what are objective functions, and now, and that's not a big addition, I mentioned what is the most characteristic or the qualifying function. And in relation to the tree, that's clearly the aspect of organic life and you could apply such an analysis to all kinds of things. But this would, as such, not give us insight in the other dimension, in the uh, other horizon of reality. Uh, because the way the different aspects form a unity in the tree is not made explicit yet. I have spoken about what is most characteristic, besides all the other aspects that apply, the aspect of organic life, but the way they form a unity 
in relation to the tree has not been discussed. And there, I think, it's the other horizon, the other perspective that comes in. Because Doevit would say that the aspect of organic life is not only the most characteristic, but it also uh, characterizes the way the other aspects function on the tree. Say the numerical aspect, what we can count in relation to the tree, the number of branches, uh, the number of blossom, uh, the numerical aspect relates, is determined by the tree as an organic whole. It relates to the tree as a living organism. Uh, and that could be uh, explained also in relation to the other aspects, the physical aspects, the kind of molecules that you find, they are determined by the tree as a living organism. And even the objective functions, they relate to the tree as a living organism. So it's the biotic aspect as the qualifying that is also giving a unity to the tree in a structural sense because it makes all the aspects function in what it calls a typical way. And the structure, as I analyzed it now, say the numerical aspect of the tree as a tree, the spatial aspect of the tree as a tree, the way it is uh, characterized in a mechanical way, the types of movement that proceed in the tree, they all are related to the aspect of organic life. That is the aspect that makes it to a unity, to a typical unity, again, as a structure. It's not the unity of the concrete tree that escapes all theoretical analysis, it's presupposed, it's not reconstructed in this way, but the unity of the structure comes from that characteristic aspect. <coughs> now maybe it's good I come back to the uh, significance of this analysis later on, but maybe it's good to uh, make some remarks about this already now. Because this type of analysis uh, has a critical function in relation to the question how can we do justice to things in their structural unity, in their own nature. Say for instance, uh, you might think that the economic object function of a tree uh, becomes manifest where the carpenter buys wood at the store. But then you would make a mistake, because when you have wood, you don't have the tree as a living organism anymore. It's the living organism, that aspect, that characterizes the tree as a tree. So as soon as you have wood that is kind of an, uh, a product after the tree is cut down, you don't have the tree as a tree anymore. So also in relation to the objective functions, the things need to be seen in their intrinsic nature. Now in relation to the tree, I won't say it's a problem if you use the root of the tree. Uh, so I'm not using this in a critical sense in relation to our human practice. It would be critical in a theoretical sense. But when you think of the way in our modern Western world, we treat animals, uh, say in, I don't know if that's the correct English term, we call it in Dutch the bio industry, the way pigs, uh, chicken, or cats, and cattle. You know, it's, it's very much the economic aspect that determines the way they are treated. And that they are living animals, living not just in a biotic sense, but in the uh, psychic sense that they have sensation and feelings, that kind of thing. I don't mean human feelings, but somehow they have sensations. Uh, that easily is completely subjected to economic profit. I won't say this is characteristic for all farmers, 
that in, in our economic situation, this is pretty much the case. And then the structural analysis of animals as an integral whole, I'm not saying that we need that to become aware of that there is something wrong, but we can give a theoretical account for it. So in this sense, just the theory of integral wholes emphasizing what is characteristic, what is typical for certain things, can be used <coughs> in a theoretical sense as a critical instrument in relation to how we deal with things. I will give other illustrations later on. First, I give another illustration. Uh, and that's the illustration of a bird's nest. If we apply the analysis that I used before, then we could say that the bird's nest uh, functions as a subject in an active sense, in the numerical aspect, the spatial aspect, the mechanical aspect, and the physical aspect. Uh, the bird's nest usually is not alive. It might be made from material that somehow is still alive, Certainly, it might come from living organisms, but I think the, the highest subjective function is the physical one. But I think everybody would agree if uh, somebody would say then that that function, that aspect, characterizes the bird's nest in its typical na nature, that that couldn't really be the case, because that would, it would be difficult to characterize a bird's nest in the, as we intuitively uh, know it, characterize it in a physical way. Of course, you can give a physical description, but that's a bird's nest. Uh, we cannot express with physical concepts as such. We need the concept of a bird to explain what the bird's nest is. Now, of, of course, the the bird's nest has an objective function in the biotic aspect, as it has an objective function potentially in an economic aspect and in others. Uh, in China, they are sold because they make food of them, and therefore they have an economic aspect that is actualized too. Um, but the economic aspect would not be characteristic for the bird's nest either. It's the relationship of the nest to the bird's life that characterizes it. So here we have an example that it's not a subjective function, an active function, but an objective function, a passive function, that characterizes the thing in its own nature. Now there is some discussion, and that's uh, nice about this illustration, that uh, within the circles of reformational philosophy, uh, there is a difference of opinion in which object function, which passive function, characterizes the bird's nest in its own nature. Uh, as I remember well, Doyot first said that it was the biotic function. Later on, he said it's the psychic function that characterizes the bird's nest as a bird's nest. The psychic function uh, is the highest function and the characteristic function of the bird as such. It's not just a living organism. It senses, it perceives, and so that's the highest function of the bird. And who is enjoying its theory? The products of animals belong to the same kingdom, in a technical sense, I come back to that term later on, as the animals themselves. So Doyle himself changed from one position to another. And Stafle, one of the students of Doyle, who worked his theory out for the natural sciences, uh, he has the same position. And one of his arguments is that uh, the different kinds of birds have also a different kind of nest. And if I understand well, uh, the kind of nest is even a way to identify the kind of bird. So that relates to the birds in its totality. Jan is nodding, so this is, uh, is on the right. Uh, 
check. I myself think, though, <coughs> that it's the biotic function that, as an object function, characterizes the bird's nest as such. Uh, I would be open for arguments that it's the other one, but what is at easy for me to say this is that, as far as I know, a bird's nest functions in the reproduction of the bird to lay its eggs, uh, to have the eggs developed to little birds, and once the little birds can fly and they leave the nest, the nest is not used anymore. I don't know how the universal it is applies, but the impression I have is that this is the case. So the nest is really part of the reproduction of the birds. And I think Doyle would agree that this is something biotic and not something that is characterized by the psychic aspect. Uh, now, whatever is the case, I'm not. Uh, it's not my intention to have a discussion about what is now characteristic, but it is an illustration that where you apply this analysis, that there can be a difference of opinion. And I think that's not a negative side of this analysis, it's a positive feature. Because if automatically all the solutions came about, I think then you might have doubts if it is not too a priori. But still, I think it helps such an analysis to get a view on what is characteristic. And now again, as it relates to the tree, in relation to the bird's nest, uh, this is not very important uh, to characterize it. If we come to relationships in our uh, human society, institutions, there I think it does become important. And I'll come back to that in a moment. First, I make some uh, general remarks, uh, kind of summarizing what I said already at least part of the general remark. And that is that clearly the structures of things, as I illustrated that with the tree and the bird's nest, those structures are not universal as the modal aspects are. They do not apply universally. They are structures of things. And they are not modes of being at least not in a universal sense, as I talked about the modal aspects. At the same time, we have to realize that it does not uh, characterize the uniqueness of the thing. The analysis of the tree is a rather general analysis. It does not apply only to specific kinds of trees, it applies to all trees. In fact, it applies to all uh, plants. They all fall under the same analysis. And my analysis of the bird's nest does not apply only to specific nests of specific birds, but applies to all bird's nests. So in that sense, it's not a structure of a thing in its uniqueness, but it's the structure of the kind of things that is analyzed. Now, doing it speaks in this respect, and that, of course, is a kind of large, what's the example? Set, a large set. Uh, it's the set of uh, physical things, of biotic things, and of animals. He calls those kingdoms. Um, and then, in relation to uh, the human person, he does not call the, the human beings together a kingdom. He calls products of man kingdoms in the secondary sense. Say art products, uh, other things. You can think of technical products. He speaks of kingdoms there too. So if you have a kingdom as a set, they are characterized by a certain modal aspect. And then, of course, in principle, you could have uh, 15 kingdoms, but if you leave out uh, mankind, then you might have uh, 
five or six. In fact, some people think that numbers should be seen as a set of things. Doing it himself does not. And some people say that spatial figures should be seen as a set of things. Doing it himself thinks not. Uh, Doing it starts to think of things in relation to the physical aspect. Uh, that is a matter of discussion uh, among Doivit and his students also. We could come to that later. The reason for Doivit, I think, is that things in a concrete sense exist only when they have also a physical aspect. You could analyze certain structures in a spatial sense, uh, a triangle is a certain structure, you can analyze certain movements. Uh, but I think Lloyd would say they never exist as such. Uh, to have a concrete thing, you always need something physical. And uh, although I'm very much a lay person there, my impression is that uh, modern physics in its theory about the physical origin of the universe speaks in favor of Doivit's opinion and not in favor of some others. But again, that's a point of discussion. Now, in a philosophical sense, Doivit would make subdivisions in the kingdoms. Uh, the kingdom he also calls a radical type, and then he has certain subtypes, some with an intrinsic nature, and sometimes because of the relationship with other things. And so he has a certain ordering of things in a philosophical sense, but he certainly does not claim that this is exhaustive. It's a kind of basic philosophical ordering, and then within the special sciences, on the basis of empirical research, that ordering can be more refined. As in biology, you have a whole range of kinds and subdivisions. There was my first remark, it's not universal structures, it's about things, but it's still rather general because it's a philosophical analysis. And as a philosophical analysis, it can help ordering what is found in the empirical sciences, but at the same time, it is dependent on what in empirical sciences is discovered. So it's not kind of an a priori system, that has to be accepted whatever the empirical sciences find, but it has to be accounted for also in an empirical sense. <coughs> the second remark relates to this. Um, I emphasized already that it's a structural approach of things, and it's not an analysis of a thing in its uniqueness. And I mentioned already that this is basic for doing it because as a theoretical analysis, it depends on the modal aspects, which are also part of a theoretical analysis. <coughs> and they can never uh, reach the uniqueness of a concrete thing. And this has a rather important implication because it means that in theoretical research and theoretical analysis we cannot reconstruct conceptually the concreteness of a thing. Our concrete experience of things and of people cannot be theoretically reconstructed. Now, I think this is rather uh, important in relation to the discussion uh, in the philosophy of mind and anthropological questions that are related to that. If uh, you read the discussions in the philosophy of mind, uh, cognitive psychology, then one thing that is characteristic is that uh, it's very rare that still a dualist position is defended. 
independence of mental phenomena over against uh, material phenomena. It's always kind of a reductionism in whatever sense. Basically, it's anti-dualism. But another thing, and that's what I ask your attention for now, is that uh, if they speak about a human person, they very easily uh, go from speaking of the person as an I to the mind. And then the analysis is in terms of the mind. There's even a whole discussion about if there is something like uh, an I that is still in the mental world is there as the viewer. And that's the consciousness is kind of a theater, but there is still a person that is looking there. The whole Cartesian dualism is uh, attacked in that sense that for Descartes it was kind of a theater, but the theater presupposes that there's someone that looks at a theater. And uh, Dennett, for instance, is making fun of that, but the whole, the whole presupposition is that somehow you can switch from I to mind. And that if you do that, somehow you still need an I. But, so they never get really to analysis of the person in its subjective identity. Now others would say this indeed is a boundary that theoretical analysis, at least objectifying analysis, cannot cross. And Thomas Nagel is an illustration of that. The subjective experience cannot be analyzed in an objective way. That somehow there is an awareness that you cannot identify the I as the identity of the human person in its subjective experience with the mind, with mental phenomena. But often there is not a clear distinction. And here you find that scientific analysis, at least in terms of a special science, needs somehow a functional approach and concepts that uh, are part of a functional approach, say mental phenomena. A mental phenomena you can analyze in terms of functional relationships and then also how they relate to material, neurophysiological neurophysio events. Uh, in the theoretical analysis, you need that functional approach. And then often they, they somehow try to get to our sense of identity in our eyes, our being a person, and they never get there. And that's, in fact, what you could say Lorik has in mind. Because the theoretical analysis can never uh, reconstruct the concreteness of our experience. And that relates very clearly to our sense of being a person. Uh, what I just said relates, and maybe those terms are familiar to you, they relate to the distinction that is often made between the manifest image, that's the way we experience, we know ourselves intuitively in daily life, and the scientific image that is using scientific concepts. And some scientists try to replace the manifest image by a scientific image. And if you try to do that, you will always lose the concreteness of our human experience. And you will never be able to get it back. Now, of course, this is some uh, extreme position. Others try to account for the manifest image in terms of the scientific image. But basically, I think that happens the same. If you try to account for the manifest image in terms of the scientific image, you will lose something essential of the manifest image. So in the relation to the analysis of uh, entities, as a structural analysis, we have to keep in mind that with this structural analysis, we never get to the concreteness of things in our experience. And then the concreteness of things in our experience, for Doirier, is the concreteness of reality itself. 
theoretical analysis abstracts from that concrete experience and so from the concreteness of reality itself. It's not that that concreteness is just something subjective of our experience. No, it's the concreteness of reality itself. The concrete experience, of course not that it's infallible, it can be corrected, it can be deepened also by scientific analysis, but it can never be replaced by it. That scientific concepts somehow can replace our ordinary human experience of reality. Now something more about the importance of this analysis. <coughs> First, a general remark, and then uh, I will elaborate a little bit in relation to our social institutions. Here too, I think, what is at stake is the theoretical recognition of the basic diversity in reality. Again, not in modes of being or modes of experience, in the sense of the first lecture, but the diversity of things in their concreteness. Uh, physical, physically characterized things, living things, animal life, humans. Let, let me limit it to that for a second. With this theoretical analysis, it's much easier to account for the basic differences that we experience in this respect in our ordinary life, in plants and animals, uh, inanimate things and plant life, than if you have a functionalistic approach. <clears throat> With this analysis asking for how the different aspects apply, what is the most characteristic, uh, how a certain aspect gives a unity to the functioning of all the aspects, uh, that there is a basic difference between inanimate life and living organism is not so difficult to see. I'm not saying that all the discussions in relation to uh, evolution and, and development uh, can be decided this way. That, that's not my intention to say that. Uh, we could have a whole discussion about what is involved here in a philosophical sense. But I'm not kind of precluding empirical research here. But it's a philosophical analysis about the concreteness of things that can be used against easier ways of reductionism, even on the basis of some empirical discoveries. Because the analysis is not in a functional sense, but is in terms of the integral whole of things. And in relation to inanimate things and plant life, plants and animals, animals and humans, of course, you have the same in relation to the human person, that in order is much more complicated and I will, won't go into that, but it does give us a theoretical instrument that can help to account for the differences we experience in our ordinary life. Even if there are all kinds of complex relationships that are discovered in the empirical sciences. This can also be applied, and maybe in uh, this circle, this is uh, especially relevant in relation how to think about uh, the relationship between the human mind and the computer. Uh, what is the difference there? Now, in some functionalistic approaches, say in terms of logic, uh, certain instrumental reasoning, it might be hard to find that there is a real difference between a human being and a computer. And, and sometimes you find uh, positions in this sense. And then, of course, if you have 
artificial intelligence and whatever, then you have the whole discussion. What is the real difference? If you apply the analysis as a Doyle's theory of entities, uh, then it's not so difficult to show distinctions, the basic distinctions, the different kinds of aspects that you find in the human person. But also, if you apply the analysis to the computer, and again, I'm not uh, defending some details, and there might be a lot of discussion, of course, this whole theory might be wrong, but it's open for discussion in itself, of course. But applying it to a computer, I think, at least to my mind, I, I would say that the computer functions in a subjective, in an active sense, up to the physical aspect, its laws of physics that are applied in construing the computer, and the computer functions anyhow in a physical sense. But that doesn't really make the computer to a computer, that it is subjective, that it's subject to physical laws, because it's designed for a certain reason. And its actual functioning, I think, can only be understood in relation to some subjective function of the human person. It is at least a technical construct which cannot be understood without the human design. Uh, there is logical analysis which is different from mathematical analysis that is applied. So it at least has, apart from its economic object function, which is not unimportant, but not characteristic, of course, for the computer, but it has at least a logical object function also and a technical object function. Now, I'm not sure what is the most characteristic. If I cannot say what is the qualifying function for the computer. I wouldn't be surprised if it would be the logical, but uh, that certainly would need more analysis and I won't have the expertise to uh, do that analysis. But in this way, I think you can show that from such an analysis of the computer as an integral whole, the computer is something very different from the human person. The, the analysis of the human person will be very different from the analysis of a computer. Certainly for the human person, you could never say that it's an objective function that characterizes the human person as a human person. So here already in theoretical discussions, uh, this analysis can help to give a theoretical account uh, for the difference, for the, the specific nature of a computer. And it, it might support intuitions that we have in our ordinary human experience, the manifest image uh, that there is a real difference between the computer and the human person. But now in relation to uh, social institutions, social relationships. And here again, I, I will <coughs> compare the Doyerian approach uh, in a very general way uh, with what is more common today. It's an approach uh, that basically comes from the modern time. You could uh, mention uh, the philosopher Hobbes uh, in some refined way, you find it in Locke. But it's typical, basically, for the liberal analysis of society. And that is that all the relationships in society and all the institutions are basically analyzed in terms of individuals and the relationships that individuals, primarily seen as an individual, uh, decide to start among one another. Uh, Hobbes view of the state is that all individuals have the right of freedom, uh, of absolute freedom in a sense, 
but because all people, all individuals have an absolute freedom, they are a danger for one another. And so they, they uh, transmit some of their freedoms to the king, the prince, the government, to have protection from him. And for that reason, they make a certain contract amongst one another. And so they uh, abstain from certain rights to have security in politics. Yeah. It's in a very simple way. But in, a, in general, you could say, again, simplifying, that the liberal idea is you have individuals, they have certain interests, certain goals, and for that reason, uh, they start some relationships, some institutions. They make some agreements amongst one another. And those relationships, those uh, institutions, always then have an instrumental nature. They are a means to attain certain goals. They have no intrinsic nature. They have no intrinsic normativity. They are the means to reach certain goals. Now, I think there are two problems with this approach. Uh, and the problems are related. The first problem is that in this way, uh, take the institution of the state, of a business firm, of a family, uh, but you could also take the university. In this way, if they are just means to attain certain goals, that they have a basically different nature, uh, cannot so easily be accounted for. Of course, you can say we started a certain institution for specific goals, and goals in relation to the state are different from goals in relation to a business firm. But if in a specific situation it would be uh, easy or at least it would seem attractive to use the state for economic goals or otherwise to use the business firm or the enterprise for political goals, why not? If they are just means to attain certain goals and there is not an intrinsic relationship between the goal and the institution. And then, of course, and you might think, indeed, why not? But the problem, I think, here is that the basic quality of the different institutions cannot be accounted for in this way. Again, in a very simple way, I would say that we cannot start with individuals that then, for some reasons, start some relationships. But we should start in a different way, that human beings always already exist in relationships. In legal relationships of justice and injustice, in economic relationships of doing work, productive work together, and being dependent on one another in that sense, in family relationships, love relationships, as we have relationships within a language, in educational relationships, and those relationships have a nature of their own. They have a certain quality of their own. They are part of being human, what being human can mean in some respect. The way human being can be uh, explored, can come to development, can be enjoyed, uh, and can be deepened. Those relationships are relationships we exist in. They are not just means to reach certain goals, no, they have a qualitative nature. They have a meaning, and uh, 
the institutions like the state, the family, uh, economic institutions, I would say they, they are organizational forms that we need to give form to those relationships. And it's those specific relationships that characterize the institutions and give a qualitative nature to those institutions. So they are not just neutral means to reach certain goals, no, they have a nature of their own. And then what is specific for institutions is that there is an authority structure. That there are uh, some people that are authorized to make certain decisions. As soon as you have an organization, you need that how small the organization is, you need that structure of authority. You say it's part of an institutional organization. But the authority should not be understood in terms of power, as is easily done when you start with individuals, with their goals. But authority should be understood primarily in terms of responsibility. And then the responsibility in relation to the institution, that it functions to its inner nature, and that the people, as far as they function in it, can function to their inner nature. And that leads me to the second point that I wanted to mention in this context. There's another problem in the liberal approach, as you find it in Hobbes, and that's the issue of normativity. Uh, in Hobbes' view, of course, Contracts should be whole. You should keep them. Otherwise, the contract makes no sense. But if you really think in terms of the interest of the individual, this norm is very hard to have a foundation for it. Because it's in my interest that the contract is kept as long as I have a profit from it. Uh, and then you could say there is kind of a sanction when people don't keep the profit, the, the, the contract, and so it's not in my interest not to keep it. But if in some situation I could act against the contract without it being noticed, then from my individual interest that should be preferred above keeping the contract. And Hobbes was dealing with that problem and he could not really solve it. And Spinoza, he admitted that if it is in your individual interest to break a contract, you should do it. Because if you really start from the individual, then that's what you should do. And so the whole issue of normativity that we of course need in society it's very difficult to have a foundation for it where you start from the individual interest. If you start from relationships with their own qualitative nature and institutions in which those relationships have received a certain organizational form, then the normativity is implied in the qualitative nature. Uh, I take the illustration of a marriage relationship. A marriage relationship as characterized by trust, faithfulness, love, respect for one another. If that's the typical nature of a marriage, it's clear that this typical nature implies normativity. You should uh, really make an effort to have it function well, to be faithful, to be respectful. The qualitative nature and the normative nature, they really go together. They are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have a specific uh, human aspects of life real quality without considering the normativity. The normativity is the way in which the quality of the relationship is disclosed, is developing. So, 
quality includes normativity. And it's the in the nature of the relationship that has that normativity in itself. It's included. And that is not something negative for the people that are in that relationship, because it's in this way that they will really be able to enjoy that relationship. And these norms also will be, or should be, the leading principle for those that are in authority. Responsibility is related to a certain normativity. It, authority, again, should not be understood in terms of power, although, of course, some power uh, is necessary. But it's not, authority is not there to have power developed, but to have the organization in its typical nature functioning well. So the authority has to serve the well-functioning of the whole organization, and that will be positive for all the people that are part of it. Now, of course, you, you could say this is a rather idealistic picture. And I'm not saying that this is just a description of reality. Of course, that is the brokenness, the evil, and sometimes power might be real. What is the motivation of people in authority? But uh, <coughs> although it's not just a description, I think it's not only an ideal or a norm, it also gives understanding of what is wrong in the situation. It's, it's the brokenness that is shown in that sense too. And in that sense, for a realistic description, you cannot leave out that normative dimension. Just because it's human relationships that have a nature, a quality of their own, and that cannot be understood without the normativity. So in a a realistic and adequate description, you need that normative dimension, even where the norm often is not kept in practice. Now, for a second, I go back to my more simple illustrations, the tree and the bird's nest. Because I like to say uh, just a little bit about another aspect of Doyle's theory of entities. In the lecture about the theory of the modal aspects, I emphasized that there are two sides to that theory. There's the side that emphasizes the irreducibility the specific nature, the diversity of the modal aspect. And there is a side that emphasizes the coherence between the aspects. It's not just diversity, it's also coherence. Now, the same two sides are there in the theory of entity. Up till now, you could say, I have emphasized the side of the diversity the specific nature of kinds of things. But there is another side too, and that is that things with their specific nature never exist in isolation. Uh, there are the relationships between things. Relationships in a modal sense, of course, but now in the theory of entities, uh, Doyle analyzes another kind of relationships, which he calls uh, maybe kind of a peculiar term, encaptic interlacements. Uh, what does he mean by that? He means that uh, things often exist in such a relationship that because of that relationship they have something specific, some specific features that their nature uh, 
changes are something specific. Uh, maybe, uh, let me put it another way. Um, take the illustration of the tree again. I have analyzed the tree uh, up till now in terms of the modal aspect being unified in a specific way because of the biotic aspect. Um, but we could look at the tree also in a different way because there is not just the structure of the tree as a whole. Within the tree, we find also physical structures, molecules. Um, if we look at an animal, we don't find just the structure of the animal as a whole. We find physical structures in the animal. We find organic structures in the animal. And we find the animal as a structural whole in terms of qualified by the psychic aspect. Now, in a plant, the molecules have a specific nature. They are related to organic life. The whole problem of DNA, RNA, RNA uh, speaks of them. Now, of course, there's a whole discussion if, if you can determine those biomolecules just in a physical way. Some people, and I would agree with them, would say you cannot understand those molecules in their specific structure apart from the function they have in organic life. And that can be argued in a more specific way than I'm doing now. Now here you have a physical structure which is, in Dewey's term, encaptically connected, interlaced with the organic structure. And in a similar sense, you could have organic structures that are encaptically interlaced with the structures of human consciousness. Organic structures that are related to you, to the functioning of consciousness. Uh, and you could apply that to uh, organic structures that for us as human beings uh, give the possibility physically of speech uh, in a way we can form certain sounds, uh, vowels and whatever, whatever. Now here you have a structure, a physical structure or an organic structure that maintains its own nature it remains a physical structure. Specific molecules, biomolecules are molecules. They are physical structures. They can be described in a physical sense. But at the same time, in their peculiar nature, they are related with and determined by another structure, the organic structure. Now this is what Dorit calls an encaptic relationship. This is not the same as a part-whole relationship, because in a part-whole relationship, the parts do not have, put in a general way, an entity structure of their own, as a molecule does have in relation to organic life. So here you have relationships of specific typical structures that are related in such a way that the one influences the other. And, as I said, I can analyze the tree in the way I did it before, modal aspects, unified in a typical way. But I could also analyze the tree in a more refined way that is a physical structure that is taken out in the structure of organic life. And then the physical structure is, has its own nature on structural identity. Uh, and for most 
uh, things, structures, you could apply an analysis in terms of structures that themselves are related. And that, that there are different kinds of that relationship, that one structure is uh, somehow determining to some extent the other, without the other losing its own nature. Uh, but I don't think it's necessary to go into that. I just want to repeat that, as in the case of the modal aspect, there is diversity and coherence. Also in relation to the antithetic structure, the structure of things, there is the diversity, the nature of things as they are, and there are the relationships. And also in relation to the institutions of society, uh, sometimes it might be helpful to make use of such an analysis of different structures being somehow related to one another and taken up in a larger whole. Especially, and that will be my final remark, especially uh, to account for the results of the empirical sciences in relation to the human body, neurophysiology, uh, I think the analysis in terms of structures with their own nature that are related and it's to some extent determined by other structures is really helpful. You can account for all kinds of analysis in neurophysiology in relation to feelings even uh, and I realize that the research has not discovered everything in this respect yet and again and that's an understatement uh, that the findings of neurophysiology don't need to have reductionistic consequences in relation to the specific nature of mental phenomena, of moral phenomena. Uh, once you apply such an analysis, because that there are relationships, is clear that it should not be denied, but that doesn't mean that consciousness, mental phenomena, uh, moral behavior does not have a nature of its own. There are relationships, but that doesn't mean that uh, some structures can be reduced to others. So it gives a kind of a, a philosophical framework to account for the findings of the empirical sciences, while at the same time being able to do justice to the meaning of the human person as a human person. What that means. Thank you, Professor Scherzen. We have even more than three quarters of an hour for discussion available. Uh, we can do it the same as yesterday, but one after the other we raise a question. I would like to ask you, would we prefer that you first hear several questions and then decide how to Alternate or one after the other? What do you prefer? No, one after the other. Okay, one after the other. Who likes to raise a question? I have several questions, but you are your audience. You have the right to ask questions first. I have, there. I have also several questions, but I can just start with one. So, uh, I have a short question. If, as I understand your Correctly, so structure would be defined as the <coughs> things and the relation. Mm -hmm. Is it correct? If science, because there are different the notions in science of what is structure and also structure. Um, yeah, with, with structure, um, yeah. Basically, the illustrations that I gave make clear what I meant by structure. 
Maybe the way I presented uh, the whole theory of encaptic structures uh, led to some confusion mm -hmm. because I did it uh, so short. Um, maybe one thing I should say, uh, but, but I have not prepared the whole uh, specific treatment of different types of encaptic relationships. Uh, um, so maybe I should have prepared this part better than I did. That I, I mentioned it just to make clear that it's not just the nature of the things, but that there are relationships in a specific way too. But let me add a little bit. And um, one basic distinction between encaptic relationships is between an encaptic whole, like a tree as an organic whole, and physical structures that are taken up into that, or uh, another illustration that Dolby uses, uh, a sculpture of marble that the marble, which maintains its own physical structure, is taken up in the sculpture as a whole, and that it's an encaptic whole too. So that is one kind of encaptic structures. But there are always the higher structure will be determinative for the lower ones. Of course, the marble is also part of the sculpture, but in a theoretical sense, it is uh, the aesthetic function of the sculpture as a whole that uh, binds, as though you would say, and captically the structure of the marble, and not the other way around. Uh, so in that sense, it would never be that the biological structure or the biologically qualified structure would determine uh, ultimately a social structure. That doesn't mean that it's not an influence of the biological on the social, um, but not in the sense that normativity could not have a place anymore. Say that in relation to the marble, of course, for the artist, the marble gives some possibilities, but also limitations. Uh, but yeah, the greatness of the artist is that he uh, succeeds <coughs> in using the potential of the marble so that it becomes a real artwork. Um, so that doesn't uh, take away from the aesthetic quality. You see, so it's not that, that basically the physical takes away from the aesthetic. No, it, it, it's opened up to uh, the, the aesthetic quality of the artwork. But that's, that's one specific type of encaptic relationship, the encaptic structural whole. Um, there are other types, uh, and, and there are other ways, like, say, uh, the snail and what's the snail house? The shell, the snail and the shell. That's also an encaptic relationship. That's not a structural whole. It's not that, say, the shell has become a structure taking up in the structure of the snail. That's, that's a different type of encaptic relationship. Uh, and, and so there are other types of encaptic relationships too. Uh, the correlative, uh, foundational, and whatever. That um, it would never be the case that the specific nature, uh, say the normative nature, uh, would be determined, influenced by the other structure in such a way that it could not function in its own nature anymore. 
that, that's, that would be against the whole idea of an encaptic relationship because an encaptic relationship means that the specific nature of structure is maintained. It might be influenced, but in its own specific nature, so also a normative structure, maintains its normative nature. Maybe, it, maybe it's useful to to um, talk something about doing its modification by developing the concept of encaptic interlacement because systems thinking, everyone is uh, talking about part whole relationships and then the part is always a part of the whole and then, then, then you look at the whole, the, 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 the part is determined by the, by the whole mm -hmm. and the doy with uh, the developed uh, the, the, the theory about the encaptic interlacement to show that the part is not that 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 that, uh, that, that, is, that there are not on, only there's not only part whole relationship in the, in the in the way that the part is determined by the whole, but the part. For, for example, the, the shell of the snake has also a, a quality on its own, a, a, an own, an own quality which which you cannot, uh, which you can distinguish from the snail. Yeah. So to summarize what you say, do I really emphasize that the encaptic relationship is not a part of the if I don't know if it wasn't my interpretation. Mm -hmm. If no. I may add, system thinking is often only, as far as I know, mainly using the concept part whole. Yeah. Well, that's the only distinction which takes place in systems thinking. So when you introduce this kind of uh, distinction, mm -hmm. you can make uh, a first step in system thinking, I think, to, to at least open the debate on that point. Well, I, I interpreted this and come to structures as kind of genetic code which would determine what you explain is that this is not the case. It gives some possibilities and it gives some constraints. That's what I understand now. I'm not sure this. Veronica, would like to ask a question? Press mm -hmm. uh, I I'm interested to know the end result of Doria Bird's distinction between the aspects of uh, reality which seem to be towards function and the structures that you're mentioning which seem to be towards trying to get hold of the concrete embedded in the structure seem to be the concretes you know the things as they are in our everyday life um, was Doyleberg emphasis on the structure trying to get nearer to reality as we as we experience it what what's the end result of that analysis um, yeah it, it's kind of a tricky question um, I don't mean that you intended that way <laughs> Well, she intended that way, then we were. Because, in a sense, I could say yes. With the structural analysis, it gets closer to the concreteness of reality than in the model of analysis. But then you have to keep in mind, and that's the best that Doyle would never say that you know you have a structural analysis that, that and then it doesn't reach it completely, but it gets nearer to it. And because it is still a structural analysis and theoretical. It is as theoretical as the model analysis. And in that sense it's basically different from the concreteness of reality and of experience. So, as far as it is theoretical, we could say it is as far from the concreteness of reality as the model theory. 
So that's in a sense it's true because it's the things in their integral whole that are analyzed and not just the modes of being. In that sense, it's closer to the completeness of reality. But in the sense that it's still completely theoretical, it is as much distinct of concrete reality as the mode of analysis. Uh, Doi, the that doesn't compromise himself. I mean, does he make a statement? What what is closer to reality? I don't think or that that he no. Okay. Um, <laughs> what, what what does he use more? Well, his work. One, the, the second volume of his main work is about the mode of analysis, and the third volume is about the structure of analysis. <laughs> and then, of course, say the, the structural diversity is much richer than the modal diversity. Uh, so, even in the philosophical sense, uh, he, he speaks about the state, he analyzes the study of the state, he analyzes the study of the church, the, of the study of the family, um, and then um, includes some of the literature about it. Um, so in that sense, you could say he, in his main work, at least in the English edition, he has this kind of, he has more pages about the structural analysis than about the modal analysis. Um, but that wouldn't mean that he uses the, the one more than the other. May I come in at, at this point, because I think we can link perhaps here on this issue, what we was discussed a little bit uh, this afternoon, I think, because his, his statement, uh, the point of closure too, you make also a statement about concrete experience. People cannot be reconstructed theoretically. That has to do with this point. But yeah, I think a lot of people and systems uh, thinking movement uh, are looking for theories uh, which come as close to, to experience as possible. So it's really relevant for them to know what is closer to. Uh, and therefore they use, for example, in interviewing techniques we debate a little bit this afternoon to get experience for the people to construct from a, in a theoretical framework to reconstruct as best as good as possible what people need according to their own standards what people like to have and on basis of that to to make a certain policy to change to transform a social organization uh, or whatever it may be so it's if you say it's not clear too, I think it's, is there any criteria concerning which you can say this, of course there are theories, but you can perhaps say something about it, that which, which criteria can be used to say this theory is better than the other or about the use of the theory in a concrete situation, because people in the system movement have a certain need for it, I think, to, to get better grasp on that, on that, on this kind of problem. So I think that's enough for the moment to to help to indicate what is debated a little bit. Yeah. And um, well, I won't say again. It's a tricky question. Uh, <laughs> but. There is, of course, the, the problem what is meant by a theory or by theoretical analysis. Um, in Dewey, uh, there is a clear distinction between theoretical analysis and concrete life. Theoretical thought and thinking in our concrete life. Um, and maybe the distinction is too clear um, because the distinction suggests that it's always clear when we do a theoretical analysis and when we don't. And that, of course, is not always 
case that is so clear. And in fact, do we identify more or less? Uh, I don't know if he would affirm that it should be identified, but in his writings he did uh, scientific work and theoretical thought. Now, in scientific work, there is a lot of activity that is not theoretical, that is not theory producing. Of course, it's, it's in theoretical framework and, and that kind of thing, but we all think that you could say that there are just concrete activities. Uh, so, that identification raises some questions that have been pointed out by staff level and I think rightly so. Uh, then, but then there is another problem, and that is, uh, although David in the beginning of his work uh, discussed also world view next to theoretical analysis and say concrete experience, later on he would more or less say that world view is part of concrete daily experience. And that's fine with me, but then you should realize that world view does include reflection. And reflection, not yet in being active as part of the, the activities, but in sitting back and thinking about. Uh, so, in a professional way, I think we should at least distinguish between theoretical thinking, the way Doibiet defined it, which means that there is always the modal analysis presupposed, uh, more concrete reflection, and thinking as it is part of daily activities. Say a mechanic that is working on an engine of a car is thinking too. But these often, it's, it's not explicit thinking. Sometimes he does, he sits, he, he moves back and thinks about it, but sometimes he's just thinking while he is active, like an artist while he is working is at the same time thinking. Now, if, if that kind of thinking, if the David has in mind, if, if it is part of ordinary life, uh, that, of course, is clearly distinct from uh, scientific abstract theory formation. But there is a kind of reflection in between that is neither one nor the other. And that there may be some yeah, transitions even between them. Um, so why do I say this? If you talk about if people want to reconstruct concrete reality and they start asking questions to people, interviewing people, and uh, yeah, maybe that's not theory formation at all, certainly not in the sense that always speaks about theoretical thought. <coughs> so, you know, you have to, and not that I think that no. theory formation, though its sense is more important than that, but um, I do think that a functional analysis that somehow uh, presupposes the, the modal diversity, as in the different special sciences, you know, specific economic concepts, specific physical concepts, specific biological concepts, and not that they're always that specific, but I think in the concept formation, you can ask a question, is the concept clearly defined in, in, in specific theory formation? Uh, if that's the case, uh, I don't think you get closer to the concreteness of reality. It doesn't mean that you cannot apply the knowledge that's the result of that theoretical analysis. But there always is some kind of a jump between the practical use of that knowledge and the abstract knowledge as such. If there is the practical element of uh, judging, judging the situation, uh, which can never be just a logical deduction from the theoretical knowledge. Have you read anything of our work in the Bertie Morris system? Have I written anything? No, have you read anything? Uh, no, I did it. Last year I read something of the proceedings, and this year I, I read a very little bit, but that's not a basis to comment on. 
Well, it's a pity they haven't managed, managed to, to confuse you about the system thinking, because it really would enrich, I think, uh, uh, the discussion with the change of this idea, because we're grappling with these things. And one thing is that, uh, which I think that uh, I disagree with Tolia about, is this, what you have pointed yourself, I fully agree that there is a differentiation between um, a theoretical or analytical thinking in what he called my experience. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, when uh, Rembrandt was painting, Beethoven was composing symphonies, uh, were they doing naive thinking or were they <laughs> doing analytical thinking? And obviously uh, they were doing neither. And yet they were very deeply involved in reflecting uh, on some idea. They were just not composing, but they were involved in trying to uh, convey some very deep understanding of whatever they were painting. And it seems to me that that opens a completely new uh, possibility of looking at the modalities as, in fact, idioms of sort. For example, most of science it doesn't use logic, but uses mathematics. Mathemat for example, uh, economics uses mathematics. Mm -hmm. And you guide yourself in your conclusions not by logic, but what the numbers say. For example, you put something in, in a numerical model, uh, let's say, assume it's a very simple demand function, and you put some price here, and you calculate according to laws of numbers what the demand will be. There's no logic involved uh, in the conclusion, but you are guiding yourself on the uh, numbers. Not pure, there is some logic, of course. I mean, to say it's Someone. Why are you using the mathematical model? That person will give you some kind of logical yeah. argument. But the main tool of argument there, the main idiom, is the numbers. Um, well, I, two comments. Um, the logical aspect, what do it also call the analytical aspect? which for Loewe uh, characterizes the scientific theory formation uh, is not identical with the use of logic in a formal sense as usually logic, logic uh, is uh, understood. Concept formation uh, for Loewe is closer to what he means by the analytical aspect than, say, the, the means of formal logic that, that in logic are discussed. So it's rather concept formation. That the concepts are clearly defined, the basic concepts, um, and then how analysis is uh, performed on that basis. And that, that's my first comment. So that there is not a misunderstanding what it means by the analytical mode. And then, of course, the analytical mode is applied also in our ordinary thinking, because there also is uh, distinguishing in a logical sense for Doyle only in theoretical thinking, the logical mode is opened up. Uh, it's a deepening of the logical mode. So even in uh, Beethoven and Rembrandt could it would agree that there is analysis in a logical sense, but not in a theoretical sense. Uh, it's, it's not theoretical concept formation that is worked out there, not at all. But still you would say that, that they are functioning also in logical mode, although that is not characteristic of what they're doing. It's the aesthetic uh, activity that is characteristic there. So it doesn't recognize that there exists a musical theory, for example. Well, musical theory is different because that's a theory about music. But it's not that the composer, although he might do theory too, certainly today, but that uh, the composer or the painter is using theories in, in the explicit sense uh, to develop his work of art. <coughs> in, in fact, I have heard that Doivet, in his understanding of the artist, is still too idealistic that he thinks they first have an idea that then they are realized in, in the artwork. And there are many artists that would deny that that's the case. They don't have first an idea that they realize 
Now they are just working on the thing and gradually with the artwork the idea develops too. And how does that distinguish from science? Science is the same happens. <laughs> Yeah, well, so there is a difference between uh, the, the theoretical conceptual side to science and the whole process of developing ideas. Uh, as, in, in, as I understand in the philosophy of science today, people and the history of science, people will make a distinction between the way theory are put in the textbook, and then it's a rather rational endeavor, and the way theories are developed whether were uh, discovered or whatever invented. But the different kind of process. It, it can be not necessarily rational, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I can develop a, a mathematical model to explain some behavior, or let's say information, um, uh, or a, you know, let's say information, actually law, it's a mathematical law, it has an equation, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that is a mathematical model, mathematical model, and that is a theory. It's written as a theory, and uh, people manipulate and prove things. Uh, they can call it a theory. Well, I, that, and that relates to my second remark. And doing it himself did not reflect on, uh, say, the mathematization of science, in the sense that mathematics is a tool, a legitimate tool in the development of science in different sciences. Uh, Stabler, the name I mentioned before, uh, mentioned uh, mathematization as one of the directions in which science is opening up, is being developed. So that certainly is an element that Dewey did not account for in his theory. But uh, in relation to that, I, uh, the impression I have is that although certainly in different fields of scholarship, special sciences like economics, and mathematical models are used, in those mathematical models, and that applies, as I understand, but I'm not a physicist, but even to physics, that the mathematical symbols, where there are, where the medical formula is applied in spe specific sciences, the symbols always relate to specific concepts that are specific for those sciences. So economics uses mathematical formula on the basis of economic concepts that, of course, are formalized. And the same is true for physics. So the specific concepts of those sciences remain presupposed in the, in the mathematization oh, yeah. of yeah. the field. So we certainly doubt. I mean, that, uh, that the, uh, if you have such a form, uh, you should call it variable. Mm -hmm. Uh, you would say uh, the relationship between one variable and the other is mathematically established, mm -hmm. not logically established, it's a mm -hmm. form of logic, mm -hmm. uh, analysis, mm -hmm. it's just uh, a steam mathematical model. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if you want to do a correlation, mm -hmm. and it happens to correlate, and people don't know why they, they correlate, but they actually fit a mathematical model, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they use uh, the quite effectively um, uh, uh, statistical models. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's one uh, thing that perhaps would be interested if you, if you, if you uh, sort of explore what, what the developments uh, in our group in terms of uh, in your epistemology. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I was going to say is that <coughs> The, the, the modalities part, I've always been very attractive, but these structures of things, it appears to me um, that it's a set of rules, a very rational rules that Doyle has developed to define things, and the, I can't see the purpose of this thing. Uh, in the when we discuss whether the nest is a qualified uh, uh, 
uh, psychologically or uh, qualified biologically. And uh, of course, it can uh, keep us occupied, and uh, we can write a few papers uh, about this. But it would be interesting to see you know, if you could look at the systems uh, side, because uh, what von Bertalansky was concerned was to dispense with the mechanistic and the, uh, the kind of mechanical rationality. And uh, being a biologist, he started looking at biology, and he, and he eventually became what he didn't want to be, a reductionist himself. Uh, so there he uh, acknowledged modality. But what I think was good with von Bertalansky is that being a biologist, he had to center around the concept of life. And uh, he started recognizing uh, systems and started uh, developing around life. I and mean, you have living systems theory, um, which is one of the schools of this. And also in management, the concern of life. And I, I think that uh, that has given it some strength, uh, some problems. And given some strengths in terms of what we define as a system or the relationship of system or the recursions and so on. Because then it's regarding the management of life. And that is, in many ways, a very strong biblical concept of life. And uh, uh, it, it makes sense. Well, uh, I can't see uh, these structures of Doyle without having any use very much use. Okay, you mentioned the case of the animals, but people could start disputing about the rules of definition. Um, but essentially, it doesn't lead anywhere. Oh, I don't know. The, the illustration, of course, of the tree and the bird's nest are, are just illustrations to explain things. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I don't mean to say that that's an interesting discussion. But when I look at the situation in the Netherlands, uh, right now, that, that uh, all kinds of organizations, the university, the hospital, uh, primary and secondary schools, and whatever, are all kinds of um, uh, seen as an, a profit organization, so as a kind of economic mm -hmm. organization. Uh, and that is, is no understanding of course, there is some understanding, and some people, uh, others than from this philosophy, also realize that there's something going wrong there. Uh, but that is not an understanding of the specific nature of different types of organizations like the firm and like the state, and, and that you need to distinguish, and not that there is not a real complexity, and that not that is not that there are not similarities, there are similarities. And there is complexity. But there I do think that this analysis, in, because of the kind of questions that are asked, not just in a functionalistic sense, but an analysis in a theoretical sense of the integral whole, that really can be helpful to make understood what is specific and what is not specific. I think in relation to it, and that's why I inserted that discussion, of course, in a simplified form, with a liberal approach in terms of individuals, means, and goals. But with this analysis, you get a completely different perspective on society and social institutions. Uh, also, the complexity that is there, the interrelationships that are there. I do think that it's very helpful. I would say on the contrary. In fact, that's what I was disappointed about uh, uh, Doya, because he lumped a lot of organizations into what he called business. So he called, let's say, the hospital perhaps, or the state, not a business, but he called it shoemaker <laughs> a business, and the university, uh, I think, wouldn't fit business, although it's being made business now. And it seems to me that the qualification or, or, or the, the setting or, or the distinction of institutions from business, from economics, I think that he was a utilitarian person in economics, so he, he missed the concept of management in economics, which is really the distinctive character. We manage organizations that serve, not as business, but by the product 
that the producers community. And those products then can be distinguished through the modalities. So that, for example, you can say that symphony orchestra is an artistic institution as is the, uh, the newspaper, which is an informative linguistic one. And that the idea of business is a utilitarian perversion. And I think that Dodoyevit was not able, I mean, uh, I, I, I dealt with it, wasn't able to make that distinction because I, we, I kept, we kept lumping in things into business and the business rules for running, let's say, a shoe, make, uh, a shoe uh, factory uh, were different, uh, were the same uh, for any kind of business, but distinctive from the vocational aspect of running a hospital. And so with that one part, uh, of our institution with the vocation as a driving force and the other one money making. You can put your money making as the other. So I think that the systems concept is far more powerful for distinguishing the, the social uh, institution and very helpful for managing them, which I think is a very important issue. Well, it, it's clear though I didn't have a theory of management. That, that I don't think that was developed. It was not his interest so much. Uh, for reason, uh, a student of Dorit, he dealt with the whole idea of organization in, in his approach of society already in the 50s, I think. Uh, but that indeed was not a field that Dorit analyzed. Um, but I wonder if he would ever say that the university has to be understood as an economically qualified organization. No, he wouldn't, no. He, no. he would not, but he, he would, would say not. that perhaps the shoemaker, yeah. and he may, I'm not sure what he would say about the symphony orchestra. No, he would not say that that's economically qualified. What about the recording company that sells records with the symphony recorded by the symphony orchestra? Oh, he probably would say there is it's economically qualified, yeah. No, there is why. One why one and not the other. You see, uh -huh. from, from a Christian point of view, then we miss the point of vocational service being the real uh, driving force to make music or to heal people or to do shoes, and and the economic aspect of exchange of profit being only a the outcome of that, but uh, making sure that we don't fall into utilitarian economics. No, but that's, though it would not uh, characterize economics in terms of making profit. That, that would would he, what would he characterize it? It would be too narrow to understand how economics. And what would he characterize it then? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm not good in factual memory. It, it, I know that he, he was, uh, and he's criticized for that by students of him. Uh, that he accepted the, the, a well-known uh, definition, I think, of John Robinson. It's a relation of scarcity of goods and, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, it's, it's that kind of approach. And you could say that that's too narrow a view of uh, economics also, yes. as Harshak would say. And I tend to agree with that, that, uh, that economics uh, has the vocation of itself. Uh, so certainly though it would agree that uh, a shoemaker has a vocation in a biblical sense and that there is nothing no. inferior with economics. The, the uh, economics, economics concept as we have it today mm -hmm. uh, is, is in, it came out of the Industrial Revolution and, uh, and Enlightenment uh, in the sense that prior to that classical uh, pre-modern economics was much more managerial, management more stewardship. And stewardship, the concept of stewardship switched around during the Italian uh, period. But that was abandoned and uh, uh, the concept of utility and so on became the driving force of uh, economics and management. So anyhow, I, what, I, what I mean is that uh, it would be very interesting for you to examine these concepts because I mean uh, I think that I see tremendous parallels in the, between the the aims of uh, uh, certainly von Bertolanffy and 
Other than that, but uh, it'd be interesting to, for you to, to assist on how ideas we can see and there is some practical applications coming. And I think that uh, I, I perhaps see systems causes richer in some way and more helpful, but perhaps it is our misunderstanding of lawyer when we're talking about recursion and encapsulation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps encapsulation may be an interesting concept, but I'm not, I'm not sure right now. Well, I'm sorry that uh, I'm not so well read in this year. I think it's a crisis of challenge, and that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> Otherwise, you have the right to make a challenge in return, if you are able to do it at the moment. But I think at the moment, we, the best thing is to get a good finish of our discussion. We still have one minute, so if there's one urgent question, I have one, but one. So on that. Okay, so you are the only one, or the other? Okay, then you have your question. Uh, oh, this, I don't know if it's a question or just I want the comments from you. I was interested in what you said about the analysis of um, it takes uh, switches the approach instead of um, starting point or a priori focusing the individual. You talked about focusing the relation. start to uh, focus the relations instead. If we then would like to um, create new relations, so then we need to start from the individuals. Yeah. <coughs> new norms. And again, let me put it this way. Either I could say uh, what I said about the individual relationship was, of course, rather sketchy. I could also say it was rather elliptical. So I left out a lot of things. Uh, I didn't uh, give a summary of the way it's social philosophy. Yeah. In fact, the way I presented it was the emphasis on the basic relationships, and you might have recognized the the, the modal aspect uh, that, that I talked about, say, the, the relationship of justice, injustice, of love, of uh, the moral relationship, Etc. So it's basic relationships and basic institutions, which is of course not exhaustive for all the relationships and new types of relationships that are developed, mm -hmm. but that somehow maybe still can be characterized uh, from some modal aspects or in whatever uh, relationship uh, between aspects. Um, so that I certainly wouldn't say. Uh, Doivit certainly wouldn't either, that uh, the kinds of relationships that we have now in society, that they always have been there from the beginning of the creation. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, there has been a whole development and there have been new types of organizational forms and, and whatever. But that was not my point. Uh, my point was the basic understanding of the human person. Uh, and in and, and liberal thinking, they start with the individual. And you could say in socialist thinking, they start with community. And Dewey's approach differs from both. Because he would take the individual existing within a diversity of relationships. And a diversity of social bonds. That, that cannot be understood in terms of it's either the individual or it's the state and maybe then some subdivisions of the state or society as a whole and subdivisions of society but uh, basic relationships with their inner nature 
their inner quality and their own normativity. Uh, and that they are, and again, I, I phrased it in my own way. Don't ask me to say something about <laughs> development and opposition. Now, sometimes I somehow included them, but maybe on Thursday I can say something more about it. Uh, that the distinction that I made between those basic relationships and the institutional form uh, is not made that way by Doivet himself, as far as I know. Doivet starts with the institutional forms, and then uh, they have a historical development, and that is the whole process of differentiation between the different the social institutions like the family and the economic <coughs> organization, that they are differentiated. And though it was aware that it was a result of historical development in modern time, um, but in relation to that, I would say, yes, but to speak of differentiation there, that means that in the former situation, you can use the distinctions that become explicit after the differentiation to understand the former situation. And that means that the different relationships are there even if there are not different institutions. Uh, but the main point is that the understanding of the human person is not as an individual that then uh, starts some relationships, but that the relationships already although the person is not um, uh, defined in the total sense by relationships, they are constitutive for being a person. And those relationships have a qualitative and a normative nature. And they cannot be understood in terms of means and goals that where the goals are just coming from the individual as the individual. That, that was the point I tried to make. And the difficulty is that in my analysis, liberal thinking there has, and the possibilities that this analysis gives uh, to do justice to the development of modernization and without trying to somehow redress that to get back to traditional communities over against all the emphasis on individuals. Now that's the dilemma, I think, that liberalism is in. The individual is, is the result of modernization in their understanding. And, and now the individual is so extreme that they think we need the community as it was before the individual was so emphasized, that that would mean that they should have to regress the process of modernization, which is of course impossible. And I think if you realize that the different social institutions, say basic relationships, uh, have developed indeed in history, and rightly so, uh, with of course the brokenness that is there, but that they have a normativity, an intrinsic normativity, then with all the differentiation that can be kept, you can find a normativity which both applies to the institution and to the individuals as far as they function within the institution. And I'm not thinking that a theoretical solution to the problem of liberalism uh, is the practical solution for society, because it doesn't work that way, but it could help the analysis of the situation and in that sense be of some help to propose practical solution if it were only to strengthen elements that are still there because I do think that the liberal analysis doesn't do justice to reality either. An, an analysis in terms of the, the, the individual is just not doing justice to what is there. And, and so with this analysis, maybe we can get sight of certain elements in reality that could then be strengthened instead of the, the development with the, the, the dialectics that are there. But uh, nothing. Uh, the analysis is better than no, mm -hmm. no analysis. Okay, I don't want to follow it. Thank you. This was a long minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no,
thank you for your rich lecture and for your good presentation. Thank you. And we hope to meet you on Thursday again. Thank you.